You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers, about hikers, for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi, thanks for coming back again to Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. I am indeed Mighty Blue, uh, otherwise known as Steve Adams, and uh, I, you're following my adventures on the trail. I'm trying to do two podcasts a week if possible. It doesn't always quite work out that way. But I just wanted to share with you how fortunate we are that in March, which of course was the bulk, bulk of my hike so far, we had over 39,000 downloads, so I'd like to thank you all for supporting me um, in my endeavour so far. And talking of supporting me... When I hit the trail in 2014, I soon discovered that i come with the wrong water filter. Everybody else had a soya squeeze. Eventually, I bought a squeeze and I loved it. I'm going again this year, and top of my list of things to buy was the new micro squeeze filter by Soya. Like all Soya stuff, it just works. You can filter up to 100,000 gallons and their full-size squeeze filter comes with a lifetime warranty. Last year, believe it or not, more than 4 million people got clean water through a Sawyer water filter. But if you think that Sawyer is just about water filters, you could not be more wrong. Nope, they supply everything to protect you, both in the backcountry and the backyard. Protect your gear and clothes as I did with their permethrin fabric treatment, which is 100% odourless after drying. With all the ticks and bugs around, this is an absolute must. They also provide sunscreens and first aid products. Find out more by visiting Sawyer.com. Yep, they're still with us. So thanks very much for supporting us, guys. I really appreciate it. So now we're up to day 36 and the last little journey I had to get into Irwin. And I'm going to tell you something about that little trip from Hot Springs to Irwin in a minute. But here is day number 36. Day 36, Spivey Gap, mile 333.1 to Irwin, mile 344.4. When I woke up the following morning, and if you recall the day before, it was absolutely freezing. It must have been warmer by about 10 to 15 degrees. Oh, yes. I forgot to mention that on the day, I don't know, it must have been two days before, or maybe it was a day before, when I told you it was cold and rainy, I forgot to mention there actually was snow at the higher levels as well. I only actually realised that, that I'd forgot to mention it when I actually saw the picture of the snow on the ground. I was driven back by Mike to Spivey Gap and started at 8am. And there was a short but sharp uphill, with gener- and it, but it was a generally easier hike with very few um, bad uphills to really tackle me. And once again, of course, I had a far lighter pack, so that really, really helped. And I recall back to my 2014 hike, and I am finding I'm doing this a lot more these days. I remember that it was on this last climb up to the top on the way to the really long downhill into Irwin that I kind of yomped up that last main climb. Um, And I remember in 2014 that this was the moment that I realized that I actually had my legs it's it I find it hard to say that I've got my legs now for this journey um I'm still getting up every mountain there's nothing that's I've failed to get up so far but I still find myself stopping quite a lot on the way up I, I do need a breather from time to time but I always remember that last main climb up in 2014 when I was hiking with a couple of young guys one of whom was about I think 17 and I was going away from him so that was a bit of a surprise for me and I realized that my legs were really there anyway then there's that very 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 long downhill um into Irwin with the beautiful Nolly Chucky River in sight all the way down I love that When I eventually got to the bottom, I checked in at Uncle Johnny's for my stick pick. I, I think I mentioned to you that I'd, when I was when I used my my stick pick is a thing that attaches to the end of my hiking pole, and I put my phone in there, do the film, and I know what happened. I can 
guarantee, because I nearly lost it once before, I must, I carefully take my phone out, turn it off from photography and put it in my pocket. I think I must have just put my, my stick, or my trekking pole on the floor and the darn thing must have fallen off again. So I lost my stick pick. I got to back to Mike's uh, quite early. Obviously, I'd, I'd got there about one o'clock in the afternoon. So really a 10 mile hike, including some uphills, although with a lighter pack, took me two hour, um, uh, five hours, so two miles an hour, which I think is not, not too unreasonable. But I just spent the rest of the afternoon just resting on my bed. I was kind of tired, really. And that night, uh, I'd actually posted in the Hiking Radio Network Facebook page that I was going to go out to this Mexican restaurant, Los Jalapenos. And there were a couple of fellow hikers came with me, Wolverine and Snickers. Really nice guys. We had a really good chat in there. And we were just sitting there. And I, and I invited anybody to come along and join if they wanted to. We were just sitting there. And this guy turns up and he says, Mighty Blue? I said, yes. And his name was Dave Wright. And he was a guy who tried to contact me in Hot Springs and see if we could meet up. But unfortunately, we couldn't because... Well, I think I said, you know, I, I don't know how to meet up with you. Um, so he'd seen this thing in the Hiking Radio Network Facebook page, and he knew we were going to be in Los Jalapenos. And he was so kind, he drove 30 miles to get there, and he paid for all three of our meals. We didn't ask him to. He didn't need to. It was so, so damn nice about it. It, it. it was just so lovely to have him there. He was really interested in our hike and wanted to talk about it. And that's a lovely thing. You, you just can't, you can't beat that, I tell you. And he said that he was envious of us, of, of all three of us, because we were through hiking. He said he just think, thought he couldn't do it because he was still working and so on. And then Snickers gave the perfect reply about how we all realise that we're lucky to have this opportunity. I think that's something that we kind of forget sometimes, how lucky we are to be in the position to take six months out of our lives and to put our lives on hold. And a number of people I've spoken to, they left their wives running a farm and they left their wives running a business. And, you know, it, it is an amazing thing that we're out, uh, we've got this opportunity. And Snickers just really, really nailed that reply. And just Dave was just delighted to be there. And we were really delighted to spend time with him as well. After that, I... Just um, the guys had a car, so I, I, thought, I said, well, I must go to Walmart, get some get some stuff. And so I went across to Walmart, got my food and supplies for the next four or five days and called Mike, and he came to pick me up again, so that was great. Now, I've been asked in the past um, to recommend a, a good four- or five-day hike in different places, and frankly, until I did the hike again, you know, so now I've been, I've done nearly 400 miles of it, I guess. Until I started doing it again, I couldn't really name a four or five day hike for someone to do. But now, if somebody asked me about a five day hike to do in the South, I would say stay at Elmer's in Hot Springs for dinner the night before, go down to the Smoky Mountain Diner and ram tons of calories down your face at six for a 6 a.m. breakfast and then hike to Irwin. It has got absolutely everything you need. We've had, in that, that, that hike from Hot Springs to Irwin, we had sun, we had snow, we had rain, we had wind, we had cloud, we had mud, we had views, we had no views, we had everything you could ever want in that period for a hike. So I'd, in the future, I would definitely say, go from Hot Springs to Irwin. That is such a darn great hike. Day 37, Irwin, mile 344.4, to a tent site just down from Beauty Spot, mile 354.4. I set off from Irwin and I'd forgotten actually how flat it was for the first, I don't know, mile, mile and a half before we started heading uphill again. And I knew that the very first shelter, the Curly Maple Shelter, was where the Rocky Pizza Challenge had happened five years ago when I came on this trip. And and I'll tell you about that in a minute when I get to the shelter. But I, I looked at the path, which was wider than I recall, in a whole new light. I really did. Because 
what happened in the Rocky Pizza sh- um, Rocky Pizza Challenge at, at, at the shelter was this. We got up to the Curly Maple Shelter. There was a bunch of us. I remember there, there must have been 15 or 20 people at the shelter that night. I don't know whether we all left Irwin late that day, but there just seemed to be a lot of people there. And written on the shelter was a challenge, which was for teams of two to hurtle back down the mountain without a backpack, get a cab into oh, in, further into oh, into Rocky's Pizza, order two large pizzas and, four, and 24 beers, then race back up to the shelter in as fast a time as possible. Well, I think somebody had done it in about three and a half hours, which I thought was almost amazing, to be honest with you. Anyway, two or four of our young, youngsters in the, in the group, and I remember their names. There was Buchanan, True Story, Hawkeye, and of all things, Science Tooth. What a great name. And they hurtled down the mountain. So they came back eventually with four large pizzas and 48 beers, which, as you can imagine, were very gratefully received by everybody up there. But I took probably two, two and a half hours to get to the shelter. They took two hours, 37 minutes to go down and come back with the pizzas and beers. It was just an amazing thing. And when I, when I got to the shelter this time, I videoed it and told the story, but I saw that nobody has ever beaten their record. Maybe nobody ever tries anymore. Maybe that was just great marketing by Rocky's Pizza that day, but it was a great, great thing. So it was really nice for me to be standing in that shelter with just nobody else around and just reminisce from what, what had happened before. It's a, it's a great little shelter, but nobody's staying there that day at all. And from then on, it was continued to be all uphill. And I was heading for Beauty Spot. I decided it was only going to be a 10-mile day, but I wanted to go to Beauty Spot because I recall that at the time, it was somewhere I regretted not staying at and not seeing the sunset. So I headed up to the Beauty Spot itself, looked around. I, it was a bit windy up there, so and I knew there were some tent sites a little bit further down. So I headed down to, oh, it must have been 400 yards there was a little road, and then next to it was a campsite with a piped stream. So I set my tent up, and I thought, is this going to be the first time I'm going to be sleeping here by myself? And I was a little bit nervous, I must admit, but I set my tent up. I got inside my tent. It was still early. It was only about 3, 3.30. And I started watching a soccer match in the UK on my, t- on my TV. Kind of talk about how the, the modern age has come to uh, hiking, let me tell you. So I'm watching this soccer match, and suddenly three or four people turn up. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not being unsociable, although, which is exactly what I was being. I, um, I'm watching a soccer match. And one of the guys started asking me about the game. So that tended to, you know, make for a quite a, quite a nice, um, a nice little dialogue straight away. I went out and introduced myself and they were lovely, lovely people. There was a couple, Sunshine and Bluegrass. Um, Sunshine's the wife and Bluegrass is the husband. They certainly march to the beat of their own drum. They're very individual people. They're lovely, lovely guys. I really liked them. And the other two were a guy called Gopher and his son Peach. And they were hiking together. And they'd sort of teamed up as a tramley with uh, Bluegrass and Sunshine. And they were just all friendly, communal people and just sitting around, making food, talking. I felt I felt the warmth again of people around me, and I really enjoyed that. And when it when it came time for sunset, about 45 minutes before it was due, we all wandered up the hill together and just sat down or, or stood and, and just watched the sun go down on top of Beauty Spot. And I remember just as it was getting as its prettiest, it was really, really quiet, just the five of us looking at this majesty in front of us. And it was just... Well, it was just awesome. Absolutely loved it. So I went back down um, and spent the night um, with my new friends. It was lovely. I enjoyed it. Day 38. Tent site just down from Beauty Spot, mile 354.4, to Clyde Smith Shelter, mile 370.4. There was, sadly, a bunch of trash in the camp and I noticed 
Peach, the young the the guy who was there with his father, wandering around every now and then, putting it all in um, in one pile together near the near the fire ring. And I, I didn't say anything about it at all. And Peach said, "I'm going to take all this stuff down. You know, they're, they're, we should be finding some beans." We, the guys, those guys were having to get off the um, get off the trail um, that day, and so they. And I'll tell you why in a minute. They uh, they said that they take the rubbish and get rid of it, which is a really good thing for people to do, and people should do that anyway. I, I do pick up a few bits of trash when I when I see them on the trail as well. Some people do it better than others, I must admit. Anyway, f- very unusually, I was first out of camp, um, and you know what? I so regret not interviewing them. I I just didn't want to. I didn't want to ask one in front of the other and and I was stupid really I should have just said can I interview you all because they all four were really good people and really interesting people they all had a perspective and you know we'd, we'd had a sort of really nice chat and I really enjoyed spending that time with them the previous night anyway I missed my chance and that was that and I started up I remember Unaka or Unaka Mountain last time it was this tall spruce tree forest right at the top of the mountain and I just loved it I was very expectant about seeing it I was looking forward to it so much I really was and once again quite a good climb but I cope pretty well with it I'm coping with these climbs better and better which is a good thing obviously and I was joined in the spruce forest by gopher and I asked if we could record in the forest because it was such a an atmospheric place there was so much the sun was kind of shining through it's a very deep dark forest and it was lighting up the moss all over the place and I thought it'd be a great place to interview and he said yeah sure that'd be fine and we were just about to do it and Peach showed up so I had the chance of interviewing both Gopher and Peach. Okay I'm here with uh, father and son Gopher and Peach would you introduce yourselves what's your real names? Uh, this is Gopher. I'm James Hembry. Uh-huh. And I'm Peach. I'm Will Hembry. And I know that you introduced Peach. <laughs> Great name, by the way. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> you introduced Peach to uh, gardens and botany when you when he was younger. Was it important to you as a family to go out together like this? Uh, yeah, I think uh, family is, is what we have uh, when we start out. And as a new married couple, my wife and I... Uh, drug our kids to gardens all along he just happened to be the youngest and yeah. got to go more than the other one and you obviously, like. obviously caught the bug didn't you somehow or yeah. other yeah so what do you do now well unemployed yeah but um, you're going to something aren't you? yeah so i just got my master's in horticulture from nc state and i'm hoping to start a job after the trail at longwood gardens in cool. pennsylvania start, that's nice yeah so how are you finding this then the two of you hiking together is that working out I think it's been pretty miraculous. <laughs> in what way? Uh, in that we haven't had any major flare-ups. No. L- living in the same tent beside one another in shelters, eating the same food, walking together every day. It's intense, Our, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it is. It's pretty intense. And and then uh, I, I've got credit that we haven't had any flare-ups to Peach because he has uh, set his stride to meet mine. All right. Uh, there's no way I could keep up with him. But you're moving still. I mean, oh every, yeah, yeah, we're. I we're mean, every, doing... everybody passes me, so he's, he's <laughs> giving me more credit than I deserve, probably. <laughs> so, are you actually are you are you guys really enjoying it? You, what do you enjoy? The, the, each other's company or the company of other people on the trail? Because we spent last night at Beauty Spot with that other couple, which you've been hiking with, mm-hmm. Sunshine and Bluegrass, right? And and that was a real communal feeling there last night, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I love all of the people on the trail. I love my dad, obviously, but. And we we started early because we were afraid of the masses of people in the bubble. We were trying to avoid like a huge party scene the whole sure, time. Sure. But I don't know. I I don't. I didn't expect to see so many people that were just so incredible and like everyone is amazing in their own way. But aren't yeah. you surprised we haven't been passed by more people? Though? The bubble must be just behind. I guess just behind us, just coming out of Os- <laughs> hot springs as we speak. I guess. Yeah, we were. We were in Hot Springs, I believe, when they said that the bubble was just getting to Newfound Gap. Yeah. 
So, All right. So that's, you know, they're about a week behind us. Right. <laughs> and some of the faster ones have passed us from time to time. Some will pass us. Yeah, yeah. But even then, you know, I, do you not spend a lot of time during the day by yourselves? Oh, yeah. Most well, of most of every day is. That's wonderful. Online. Don't you think that's incredible? You know, we've, we've got the forest for ourselves. I mean, we've just seen Beauty Spot last night, and now this is, how do they pronounce it? Yunaka, Yunaka. Yunaka, Yunaka. Yeah, Yunaka yeah. Forest by itself. We're standing right in the middle of this these really tall spruce trees. The sun's coming in, and I've got a video of it, and some of you guys will see it, but really, it is magnificent up here. Yeah, it is beautiful. And you've got to get off the trail today for just for a day, unfortunately. What's going on? What's going on? Well, last night our my tent zipper broke. Um, thanks, Big Agnes. We set it up about ten times before a catastrophic failure. Um, so we need to get a new tent before we get into the really buggy season. Um, and we and yeah. we just have some friends that want to give us another night in a bed, and nice. they've been so hospitable. It's hard to say no. You know? I could tell it was catastrophic failure last night. <laughs> I heard you struggling with it. You suddenly went, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bluegrass came over there to see if he could fix it, and he was like, oh, nah, man, nope. These nylon uh, zippers are hard to repair. That's They're right. not like the metal ones used to be. But. Yeah. Well, look, I wish you both well. I'm sure I'll see you on the trail again, and thanks, thanks for talking to us. No Thank problem. You. Thank you. Cheers. How about that? He got his son interested in... In, it, in gardens and so on at a young age, and now he'll be working in horticulture. I love that. What a, the, the relationship was so nice to see, and I, and I thoroughly enjoy spending time with the two of them. A, a couple of miles down at Cherry Gap Shelter, I I went in for lunch, and there was just go from peach in there then, and um, and so we just were chatting away, and then someone turned up, um, a guy called Tank. He said he was quite a serious looking guy to start with, and I was facing away from him. He got in the shelter, took his pack off. He said, what are your trail names? And they said, Gopher. And the other one said, Peach. I said, I said, Mighty Blue. He said, Mighty Blue. I mean, I wanted to catch up with you. I to, he said, I listen to your shows. I really enjoy them and so on. He came out to talk to me. And, you know, I, I don't know how to react to this in some ways. It's, it's a surprise to me always, but people seem to know, some people seem to know who I am, and some people have absolutely no idea and no interest. But it's kind of strange. But Tank was so pleased to, I don't know, to, to, to chat. And then people I'd met on the second day, Peanut and Tyler, uh, turned up. Tyler is now called Skywalker. But they're young guys I met very early on. I think it was in so I think it was in Gooch Mountain, Gooch Gap Shelter. Yes, yeah, Gooch Gap Shelter. And Tyler was having a peanut was having a bit of a problem with his knee at the time, but he seems to be fine right now. And then bluegrass and sunshine turned up, and suddenly there seemed to be more and more people there. And we all talked about going to the Clyde Smith uh, Shelter, but there was a potential bailout at Greasy Creek Hostel or as they call it, Greasy Creek, <laughs> Greasy Creek Friendly. So they think hostile sounds hostile, so it's Greasy Creek Friendly. Um, and I really wanted to go to the shelter because I wanted to quickly get into the uphill the following day on Rome Mountain. I'm always trying to plan the hike ahead so I know what I'm doing the next day. And I like, personally, to have a biggish climb first thing because that's when I've got my best energy, so having a big climb first thing is better for me. But I knew there was a potential bailout at this Greasy Creek Hostel, which was about two or three miles before the shelter. And suddenly, I started seeing a few other hikers. They are starting to catch me up at last. I got passed by at least four four hikers, and some are so fast, but and they just kind of flew past me. So I... I passed the, the bailout to the hostel. I didn't want to stay another night in the hostel. I was quite happy to be in the shelter, and I headed on to the shelter. But I thought to myself, there's a good chance, and I knew there was going to be rain tonight, that night rather, there's a good chance that I won't get a spot in the shelter. Because I seem to remember there were probably places about seven or eight people, and I thought, well, if none of them take the bailout, I'll be outside in the in the rain. And I wasn't really looking forward to it. And I got to the shelter... And it was just Tyler, or Skywalker, as he's now become. And we were all shocked. We couldn't, we couldn't believe, actually, how um, how the how the place was empty. Everybody else must have bowed out. And he'd gone down to get some water. And one thing about these shelters, if you don't know, when you come to them 
sometimes there's a pipe right next to the shelter, and that is marvellous. But normally it's a bit of a walk. Well, this one was about a quarter of a mile, and uh, he, he went down to get his water, and I thought, oh, God, I've got to come get some water. And suddenly a young guy called Skylar turned up, and he said to me, he said, anybody need the water? I said, oh, yes, please. So he took my, took my uh, bottle <laughs> came back about 20 minutes later uh, with a full bottle for me. So that really worked out quite nicely. And the last two people came in were two young lads. I wish I'd had the chance to interview them as well, actually, called the No Bros. Because they're two brothers going Nobo. They're doing 20 to 25 miles a day consistently. And they are so skinny. And I'm thinking, about, I said to him, you guys have got to be ramming calories down here. He said, we are eating all the time, as much as we possibly can. So that was the the group that night. Um, we had we were all knew the rain was going to come, and the rain did come, and it rained all night long. Um, but it was a nice place to be. It wasn't that cold in the shelter. So it, in terms of shelter stays, it wasn't that bad at all. Day 39, Clyde Smith Shelter, mile 370.4, to Carver's Gap, mile 380.4. Everything about today, because I'm now talking about today, (laughs) was supposed to be horrible, both the weather and the climb up Roan Mountain. It had rained all night long. It was raining when we woke up. But when I went out to do my normal (laughs) morning business... Um, it wasn't as bad as it sounded on the roof of the shelter. I think that's the thing with these shelters. With these, Some of them have got metal roofs, so they make a hell of a racket. But when I went out, it was kind of light rain. It wasn't too bad at all. And when I thought about it, I'd made a plan. My, my plan was to walk 10 miles in miserable weather today and then enjoy the balds after Carver's Gap tomorrow when the forecast is really sunny. And as you know, I love balds, and there's a whole bunch of them coming up. I remember somebody writing to me when I was doing this in 2014 and doing a blog and telling me that this is some of her favorite hiking in the whole trail, and it was that bit north of Carver's Gap. So, so to do that, I needed to get to Carver's Gap today, which meant I had to go over Roan Mountain in what was going to be dreadful weather, or so he thought. So with... Tyler and Skylar still asleep with the no bros now already gone. I decided to go for it. And straight away, probably because I said, yes, I'm going to go for it and go and do it. I was really energized. Even the uphill to start the morning just didn't phase me. And I, I was soon heading down again, knocking off three miles in just over an hour. And believe you, believe you me, for me, that is flying. And, and, and it just, the day just seemed right. It, the rain started to fizzle out, and by the time I got to the gap, which was the beginning of the climb up Rome Mountain, um, I knew that I had a, a five-mile, 2,000-foot climb from 4,000 feet up to 6,000 feet up Rome Mountain. But with the rain now finished, I'd taken off my, I'd now taken off my uh, fleece and my rain jacket, and I was just sitting in my shirt and my my regular hiking pants. And I was moving, I tell you. But of course, going uphill, I start trudging. And I soon found a water source. Water has been a real issue for me. I can't really glug down tons of water like you're supposed to. You sh- I should really be drinking a gallon of water a day, I guess. I can't get anywhere near that. And I started out the day with limited supply of water because I certainly wasn't going to go down that quarter of a mile trek at the Clyde Smith shelter to get water that I referred to earlier on. And um, I knew I needed more water. And at last I found some. And these water sources are off the trail. There's a blue blaze because we follow the white blazes, but every now and then there's this blue blaze that says water. And this one was only a couple of hundred yards. And I could see actually where the water was. And I went down there. It was perfect beautiful pipe and I gathered up my um, my bottle of water, went back and glugged half of it, to be honest with you, uh, straight away. So I, I knew that there would be plenty of water today anyway because of, the, um, because of the rain that we'd had. So I got back into my slow rhythm uphill and I even began to enjoy it because the slope wasn't too intense and I, 
I didn't have to stop as much as I normally did, and I just pushed further and further up. And then at what looked like the top, the path headed down again into a woody sort of grassy area where I sat and had lunch. The rain, as I say, the rain had stopped. It was very mild now, and I was really comfortable with my pace and how, how I was doing. And it's one of those days where everything seemed to go right for me today, and and Tank came past again and because he'd obviously gone to that Greasy Creek shelter the night before. We said hi and chatted for five minutes, and he went on. And, and I looked around me, and I looked up, and there was blue skies. So from this terrible day I was supposed to have, I was having a great time. And I was energized once more, and I pushed on to the very, very top. There were lots and lots of switchbacks. And then, and I don't know the history of this place, but at the top of this this Rhone, Rhone Mountain, there's the site of the Cloudland Hotel. Uh, I guess it's a previously doomed project. And, and they'd built this hotel, and obviously people hadn't got, or they were going to build this hotel, and maybe time moved on and people didn't want to come to this place. But when you get there, there's this nice flat area of grass where they could have a hotel, I guess. Um, and once again, it's just lovely to be at the top there in a grassy area just, just hanging out. But I decided at that point that it was appropriate to answer a question from Daryl Fleischer. Um, Daryl's a friend of the show, and he's, he's written to me several times. He'd asked how I was finding the trail this time compared to last time. So having just dragged myself up a five-mile uphill, I thought it was the perfect time to respond to Daryl. I'm recording this at the top of Rome Mountain, where, right on the site of where I think it was called Cloudland, a hotel was supposed to be, or perhaps even was, and there's a little bald or flat spot out in the middle there. Seems so innocuous that there could be a hotel here. Um, I'm actually replying to a question from Daryl Fleischer, who's a friend of the show, published um, a post on, um, on the Hiking Radio Network Facebook page and asked how different the trail is for me this time. Well... I started the month early, um, and that obviously is different. There's there's been some a lot of snow uh, at times. There's been a lot of rain, but there's also been some beautiful days as well. I don't think I can really complain about the weather. I do notice this thing about people always checking for, and I, I'm just as guilty as anybody else, checking for uh, service, and uh, it's it slows down the conversation in in the shelters. But once everybody's caught up with home everybody's just just as chatty as ever and and just as friendly and just as helpful as ever I think I'm feeling the difference of five years you know 61 was quite a I thought quite an achievement to do it at 61 but to do it at 66 it just is an added um I don't know it's an added factor and the reason I'm doing recording this at the top of this Mount Rome mountain is it is one hell of a climb (laughs) it's five um, five miles up, but uh, a five mile journey would rather take you from 4,000 to 6,000 feet. So it's not too bad, but I, I can definitely feel it. And now I'm at the top, I feel a whole lot, a whole lot better, I'll tell you. But I think to myself, back in 2014, this very climb was even worse for me. And I think it was even worse because the weather was so bad that day. So I think that that's it. I think hiking is so much easier in better weather. Um, so... There's still not a mountain I haven't got over. I don't think there's a mountain I can't get over. And I, I, I think, uh, I believe I'm almost on exactly the same pace as I was before. So I guess it's not much different. Every every person's different, obviously. Every view is different, funnily enough, as well, because, of course, those views I saw on good weather and those views I saw on bad weather. Some of them are reversed. Some of them are exactly the same. But... Uh, I must say there's no, not been a moment when I've regretted coming back out here. But thanks for the question, Daryl. If any of you have any other questions, please um, write to me on the, hiking, on the Hiking Radio Network Facebook page or just steve at mightyblueontheat.com and I'll try to answer you either on the show or on, or on a YouTube video or, I don't know, just a general response. On the way down, over a very rocky path, I've got to tell you, I had the worst of my falls so far. I made a silly mistake of trusting a wet log. I don't know why I would ever do that, by the way. And I really paid for it. 
I went straight down on my left knee and it really, really hurt. I shouted amongst a few words <laughs> between gritted teeth, number eight. I, I checked that nothing was broken and headed on, uh, uh, and it just it just headed on and because there's nothing else you can do. When you fall over, you can sit there and cry if you like, but there's nothing else you can do. If you're not dead, if you haven't broken something, you might just as well get on, get up and move on. And by the way, I'm not sure I told you that I, fall number seven was actually the day before where I just stepped off the trail for a moment into what I thought was a it's a few leaves, but it turned out to be quite a deep pile of leaves, and I sunk into it and fell over. Just ended up on my backside, but that was number seven. Um, anyway, so I, I checked nothing was broken, and it wasn't. I, I got a bit of blood, and it wasn't too bad, so I just headed on to Carver's Gap. And Carver's Gap has some real resonance for me. In 2014, I was supposed to meet my wife, and we just could not find each other. We were both there at some stage. I'm not sure we were there at the same time. We seem to not not be sure about when we were there. Um, but it was so socked in with fog. And this was, we were supposed to meet at 2.30 that afternoon. I didn't see her till 8 o'clock that night in Boone, North Carolina. It was a terrible time, I must say. And, and I'd been thinking to myself, I wanted a better memory of Carver's Gap uh, than I had last time. And I was just about to get that better memory when I'd fallen over. So Carver's Gap still, for me, sucks, I'm afraid. I, um, I soon hitched a lift to Rome Mountain, which is a long way down the, down the mountain. Rome Mountain is a town, by the way, at the bottom of the mountain. And I hitched a lift there and called the hostel I was supposed to be staying at. I'd booked it at the top of the hill. And they said, yes, there's one more place in the bunkhouse you can stay here. And I, got, I went to a place called Bob's Dairyland for a cup of coffee where I met another hiker, which was nice. Uh, he said he was staying in the same place I was staying at. I'm not going to say where, where it is. But the guy turned up. Um, I'd, I'd called him. It's about three miles away. 20 minutes later, he still wasn't there. So eventually I called him again. He said, yeah, I'm on, on my way. He turned up and they double booked it. <laughs> so there was no room at the inn, as they say. But very kindly, he'd found a place for me the Rhone Mountain B&B. And I've got to tell you, I am so glad that he did. It is really, really nice, this bed and breakfast. So uh, there are three other guests here. Car 54, who we've met before, and um, a, a married couple. I can't recall their names right now. Um, but we all went out. We had pizza, and it was really, really nice. So tomorrow, the sun is due to shine brightly. There will apparently be no rain at all. And I've got a bucket load of balds coming my way, which you know I'm going to love. The fact that the following four days are all due to have rain does not diminish my current enjoyment and anticipation one iota. I cannot wait. I'll see you next time.